Hello, I'm Hilton Super, the Vice Chairman of Student Group. Today, I'm interviewing Jan Amstutz, who's founder of Beam. Now, this is where we interview people who are changing the world, people who are inspiring us with their achievements and creativity, and particularly the acumen with the use of technology. Now, in previous interviews, Dennis Guada and myself have interviewed over 250 amazing people and achieved more than 14 million views on YouTube. Now, this interview series is with our other platform, Cities ABC and Open Business Council, which are basically web 3.0 platforms utilizing technologies that employ, you know, truth and trust through the unique um, corporate digital identity that we're using and using blockchain and the deployment of data analytics and AI and machine learning. So today I'd like to introduce you to Jan, who's the founder of Beam. Welcome, Jan, to our podcast on your unique solution on, in terms of what augmented reality, which is a very big emphasis on face-to-face -face communication. I'm really excited to hear a lot more about that. Thanks for having me, Hilton. I really appreciate it. So Jan, you're an acclaimed entrepreneur. Okay, you've pioneered Beam, um, which is very in innovative as a platform, which is your mobile phone as an augmented reality um, um, device in order to transform digital communication. And you've been working with you know acclaimed uh, um, partners like Vogue, De Beers, the Universal Group. Music Group, Google, SAP, Qualcomm, and T-Mobile. I mean, these are great customers to be working with. So tell us a little bit more about Beam. Uh, so so Beam, Beam is my, my passion. Beam, Beam is you know, the, the reason I wake up in the morning, the reason why I get stressed, the reason why I get calm. Uh, for me, uh, Beam started off as uh, a thesis. Uh, and this thesis was that um, we as human beings have, uh, over thousands and thousands of years become incredibly good at communicating with each other. It's one of the most challenging things we do ever. Um, and we've become very good at it, but, uh, we've become very good at it face to face, physically in the same location. Kind of the process of evolution has optimized that format. Um, and now over, you know, the last couple of hundred years, uh, as our societies grew larger than Kind of localized tribes, we've had a problem. And that problem is a, a communications over distance problem. How do we communicate with someone outside of our direct vicinity? Uh, and uh, essentially, you know, what we as humanity have done is we've created various technologies to uh to solve that issue. Um, you know, the best technologies of the time, you know, a couple of hundred years ago were you know marathon runners, horse riders, and carrier pigeons. Um, we look back on that time and think, holy shit, you know, having to communicate with a significant other or, or someone else important and sending it on the leg of a bird sounds pretty wild. Um, but, you know, since then we've created some, some kind of better solutions. You know, the Morse code uh, assisted in creating the British Empire, the ability to communicate over distance and coordinate effectively. And then, you know, about 140 years ago, we had the telephone. The first time we could intimately uh, communicate over distance, um, you know, by hearing someone that you know, by identifying with that human being through voice. Um, but then, over the past uh, sixty or seventy odd years since video conferencing was invented, uh, we haven't gotten much further. Uh, and you know, this thesis that I speak of around Beam is is, is a very simple thesis. One, it's going to be inevitable that we as human beings will create a new medium for communication that's more effective than video. And number two, we will create a, um, just give me one second. Um, and, and, number, and number two, we will create a solution uh, that is more effective emotionally and more effective psychologically on communication. And so, with Beam, uh, that thesis that we created, um, I created a tech company around it to solve that challenge, that next step for communication. Yeah. So before we get into the nuts and bolts of Beam, I want to, you know, you're very passionate about Beam and and this, what I call, more 
digital human communication. But where did this journey start? So, I mean, where were you born? Where did you study? And you know, what what was the journey like to where you got to today? Um, so, so basically, my upbringing was a little bit a little bit counterculture, a little bit rebellious. My parents were were massive rebels. Um, they were uh, counterculture individuals, if you would call them that. Yes. Um, and uh, I was born in Switzerland, uh, but my parents uh, quickly moved me uh, to Australia uh, onto a hippie community uh, where they built their own house, solar power, rainwater, uh, fruit orchard, chickens, uh, and you know, basically the bane of my existence uh, was the cow that I had to milk before going to school. Uh, and you know, Swiss families, when they emigrate to a new country, uh, often don't uh, trust the dairy industry. So we had our own Swiss brown cow. Um, and that you know, prevented me from watching morning TV. Uh, although you know, our, our morning television was a tiny black and white TV the size of an iPhone screen that ran off our solar power system. Um, and so my upbringing was very different. And I thought that was a, ma a major disadvantage. Um, but you know, over over the past you know couple of years, uh, I've realized that you know being different and having a different perspective uh, can be a superpower. Uh, and you know the the one the one you know major thing that I credit for my childhood is that you know growing up on a hippie commune, we had incredible communication. Uh, Forty families living on a forest block uh, were able to uh, interact. Uh, intimately with each other in, in a way that you know, uh, you know our, our modern society often forgets, mm -hmm. uh, and and so that whole kind of to go full circle with the founding of Beam was you know, almost like me going full circle, you know, back to my childhood roots to figure out you know how do I how do I get this intimate uh, communication that I was used to in my childhood, uh, and you know give this to the world in a way that you know we can we can use it on a, on a global scale. Mm -hmm. So where did you go to university? Uh, I skipped. I skipped university. Uh, again, one of those rebels that you know, thought, you know, uh, mm -hmm. I don't have time for university at this stage in my life. Uh, I'm going to shoot straight into uh, something uh, that um, you know I can wake up to and, and, and feel like I, mm -hmm. uh, I I'm doing the right thing and have the right purpose. I think there will be a time in my life uh, where I where I think, okay, maybe you know. 50, 55 years old, you know, now it's time to go and study uh, something that I'm passionate about. Yes. But you're very passionate about this, uh, you know, digital human communication, which is evident. Um, but so when you got the idea of Beam, what was your, what was the catalyst that pulled it all together? Was it the technology? Was it people? Or was it putting the right people and the technology together in order to bring been to fruition. So often the the tech world and you know looking at the Bay Area uh, specifically, often uh, companies are built out of a technological kind of thesis or a technological um, process. You you put a, a bunch of engineers onto a problem and you create the highest possible technological solution, and the tech is the solution. Um, for for us, we looked at it you know, slightly differently, uh, and you know the the challenge was more of a psychological challenge. You know, how can we psychologically create the next step forwards? And so you know the solution is is gauged by our psychological improvement uh, in communication. So it's a very very kind of like um, you know, we would call ourselves kind of where where card before the horse. But the cart is much more important. It's, it's kind of you know the package that's delivered. The psychological interaction between humans is the most important part, and whatever drives that um, uh, solution is kind of you know the, the secondary process uh, to uh, to the to, to the creative process. Mm -hmm. So you were, you were obviously it sounds like you were on the West Coast when you sat down with some some individuals. Um, and so your your process that you put together in terms of co-founders or were you or did you find yourself the lonely pioneer trying to gather the team around you? 
and then build the tech? How did what was the what was the steps that you went through? So, so definitely the lonely pioneer route, as, as you would call it. Uh, it was um, very interesting. Uh, I, I I jumped into uh, call it entrepreneurship um, alone, uh, and had, had a kind of a very deep conviction that um, the the technology and the solution that would be created would be something of, of great value to to society. And so, you know, initially, you know, I uh, assisted to put together a uh, incredible uh, research and development, a techni technical team, computer vision scientists, AR engineers, um, you know, some mathematics Olympiad winners uh, to try and crack um, the, the the problem around the thesis that that I had built. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it, it was more of like a a gradual step process as opposed to a structured decision, you know, do I jump in this alone or not? It was just kind of, you know, a free flowing concept of, you know, how do we get uh, to a point where we can, we can create a technology around this thesis. Were you able to attract, in, attract investors, uh, seed investors into, uh, into Beam very early on? Um, so the initial stages uh, from my previous career, I was a uh, commodities trader before, um before this journey um i used uh, a bunch of my savings uh to to kind of seed the initial process uh and then uh, managed to raise around about five million dollars uh in in seed venture investment from uh, some institutional investors and also from a group of very strategic angels um i guess that was kind of my hedging my my risk of being a sole founder as you find a bunch of kind of people who are like a little bit older or further along on your journey uh, than you are uh, to make sure that you're not crazy and to you know, pat you on the back when you do things right or you know, slap you on the wrist when you do things wrong uh, you know, and, and keep you in check. And I think that was, that was very important to my trajectory is having a group of individuals around me that uh, not just investors who brought cash, but who were also able to, uh, to mentor me and, and, and keep me on the right track. And would you say it's it's still early days? But would you say would you change any of the approach that you that you used in getting to where you are today? I mean, hindsight is an incredible tool, yeah. um, and it's it's a really it's a really interesting scenario. It's kind of like you know looking at a, a parallel universe. If I change this little piece, uh, would I have changed my trajectory? For good or for bad, and at what point would I have turned better or worse? Um, I think you know I needed to be on the journey that I was on uh, to learn the things that I know now, to be able to reflect on the things I could have done differently. Um, but you know, would they have led to a better outcome? Is is questionable. Um, I think you know every every struggle or every uh, point uh, where you think I could have done that much better is a point that. Uh, you, you learn something very critical about yourself mm -hmm. and about the business. Um, so, yeah, di di difficult to answer that question, uh, but I, I'm, I'm definitely um, definitely aware that you know the uh, the challenges are also opportunities in, in, in disguise. Yeah. But as in terms of the entrepreneurial landscape back in 2019 in London, you know you 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 know you were involved in the startup ecosystem. Um, and in the process and the journey that you've been through, you picked up some awards for the technology, which we'll go into a little bit later. But tell us a little bit about that experience. Yeah, I think I think the the whole story around creating a new communications medium, creating holograms of humans into someone else's space, picks up yeah. a lot of intrigue. Um, you know, very early on, we we won uh, best AR and VR company. In the UK, even though kind of those technologies are just a facet of what we do, um, that was great validation. I, I guess these kind of awards are the are the, uh, the affirmations that what you're doing isn't isn't like a snow globe experience that you think is cool, but none of the world kind of um, uh, agrees on. Uh, and so then, you know, post that, we won uh, most innovative startup in London uh, and uh, an award, a global award from the Smithsonian Museum. And the USPTO, the, the uh, Patent and Trademark Office in the US, for being one of the global innovators to watch. 
Uh, and I think I think you know the reason why we won these awards is not necessarily because we're special, but because of you know the narrative and the, the ambition of us to create something so uh, different uh, and so um, so groundbreaking. You know, resonates with people. So tell me a little bit more about. I mean, we all understand mobile technology. Um, we know how to use our FaceTime. We know how to use WhatsApp and Zoom and all these technologies that give a a pretty realistic, like you and I speaking to each other. You in New York, I'm here in Lisbon, and we're talking to each other, and we are technically in the same digital space, but separated by 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 space um, ge and geography. So. Going back and thinking about making this more realistic, what is unique about Beam that has taken what you and I see now, which is this reconstitution of electrons, and I can see you, you can see me, I can hear you, you can hear me, okay? I, I, I see your environment. I've got an artificial background behind me, so I'm pretending to be somewhere I'm not, okay? Tell me, in for our, what what is Beam solving or augmenting, and what does yeah. AR mean? So, massive question. Uh, and <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's it, it, it's the like the, the multi million dollar question. Yeah, <laughs> the, the, the final question on who wants to be a millionaire. Um, <laughs> one. Uh, so 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 basically, there's a couple of things here to to, to kind of dissect. Uh, yeah. First one is why? Why do we as human beings require a new medium to communicate over distance uh, when we have? You know, something like uh, you know, video conferencing uh, that seems to be relatively effective. You know, putting aside the fact that video conferencing is a is a very old technology, um, you know, Skype was launched basically twenty years ago, uh, and, and you know, we're we're still kind of sitting on very similar tech, and you know, maybe a couple of new buttons, and maybe some better syncing, uh, and some faster internet speeds. Mm -hmm. But the question is, why? Why do we need a new tech? Um, and uh, the pandemic, you know, everyone says, oh, video conferencing was great for the pandemic, but video, vi video conferencing was also um, a, a very interesting test for us as humanity uh, during the pandemic. Is video conferencing enough? Do we ever have to meet face to face again? Uh, do we ever have to travel to a meeting? Uh, and uh, the last one, which we get a lot in the educational space is, does a child have to go to a physical classroom still? Uh, or can they do all of their schooling remote? Mm -hmm. And in kind of all of these questions, um, we've seen kind of major indicators that the answer is that video conferencing is not good enough uh, for us uh, to not have to still meet face to face. And that's a, uh, a technical problem um, because it's technically not good enough to solve our psychological needs. Um, we still need uh, that face-to-face -face meeting. We still need to go to that classroom. Uh, and, and there's a number of psychological things happening there. It's the transfer of information, i.e. The, uh, the, the, the credibility of that information, the speed of transfer, and the effectiveness of that transfer. You know, are you understanding what I'm saying? Are you able to process it, keep it, uh, and disseminate it? Then are you, are you able to communicate in the opposite direction effectively? Mm -hmm. uh, and th there, there's there's transfer of credibility, transfer of intimacy, transfer of trust. Um, you know, you can't uh, you can't do that uh, as effectively over video uh, because the technology simply doesn't provide those psychological triggers. So that, that that's the that's the reason you know why um, you know, video isn't good enough uh, to supplant face to face. And with mm -hmm. being, you know, we we never say that we want people never to meet in person again. Um, it's more a case of, you know, if face-to-face -face isn't possible or feasible, um, you know, Beam is the next best thing because uh, it's better than video uh, for, for that psychological transfer. Mm -hmm. so that's, that, that's, that's that first premise is, um, you know, we need, as humanity, we need a more effective, efficient way to provide credibility and trust over distance. Mm -hmm. uh, I think... Um, you know the, the the environment of 
uh, a classroom with students uh, and the teacher, the intimacy required for development uh, of that student, that child, the social needs. Um, you know, you could say, you know, if you can talk to your friends over FaceTime or video, that social needs should be should be met, but they're not uh, because it's not effective enough. I think you know we're, we're doing a, a, an incredible um, uh, trial with a number of hospitals here in the US where uh, parents of children in isolation going through cancer treatment uh, are able to beam themselves into that child's hospital ward where it's impossible uh, and not feasible due to um, uh, due to the isolation requirements of that child to have any physical presence of their family. Uh, and so it, it's that level of intimacy um, that we haven't been able to achieve with video conferencing and where Beam uh, provides that solution. And, and then the other side of it is, you know, um, how do we do it technically? Um, the, uh, the perfect ingredients for any communications software is one, it needs to be easy to use, needs to be accessible, um, and it needs to be um, extremely fast. Uh, in order to um, satisfy the, the communicational needs uh, mm -hmm. of society. And so what we've created is, is as simple as um, opening a Beam's application on your mobile device. Uh, and within seconds, you can stream yourself either as a recorded message or in real time as a hologram call into someone else's physical space. Uh, and the way that works um, for anyone who, who's kind of hasn't been following AR for for uh, for the past couple of years, like me in my, in my AR bubble is, um, a video stream of a human, uh, appears physically in your space through either your phone's lens, uh, or through, um, augmented reality glasses. And this augmented reality glasses seems very futuristic. Um, but, uh, you know, Apple, uh, launching this summer, uh, and depending on when this is released, um, Apple may have already launched. Um, it's, it's happening, um, in a, in a matter of days, uh, uh, an AR and VR device, which will be groundbreaking for the entire industry. And we'll see this massive pile on of other companies also announcing and releasing, uh, their headsets. Um, you know, people like Google, Samsung, Snap, Meta with a new headset, uh, Niantic with a new headset, uh, and all of the, uh, Chinese, Taiwanese and Korean uh, uh, other telco providers and, and, and hardware providers. And so this whole concept of AR glasses is, is something that's, that's really coming to, uh, the public eye, uh, very soon. And so what we can do is literally as simple as putting on a set of glasses. Um, you look at a floor space and, you know, Hilton, you would appear in front of me as a hologram and, and talk to me, um, as if you were physically pacing around on my carpet in the, in the living room. And psychologically, that's very a very interesting process because it means we achieve that sense of presence, that ability for the subconscious mind uh, to believe uh, that uh, we're getting the same triggers as a physical interaction. Yes. Uh, and that's what becomes truly exciting. So I'm just trying to bring this back down to earth. What you're saying is that technology that was used in Star Trek in principle as a a visual, I'm talking visually rather than technology, is that there's a physical presence of you in somebody else's space. And that is an augmented experience. So you digitally recreate yourself, but you put it put yourself in the space of the person that you're communicating. And it's two ways. So you could be, yeah. if I'm communic if you and I were doing this by beam, you would be in my office study at home. Yeah. And I would be in your office study in New York. Even though we're you know, three, 4,000 miles away from each other. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, and that, that's the crux of it. Um, and what, what's important is you know, the way that we built this technology is um, we stream what my camera, so, I, so I'm streaming into your space. Actually, it's actually me. It's no, no CGI, no cartoon. Um, nothing fake. It is, it is me in high definition, my movements, my facial expressions, my emotion is all transferred one to one, uh, into your space with, with no kind of interference from any technologies that could, uh, trigger the subconscious mind to think 
that something is incorrect. Mm -hmm. And that's a big differentiator between us and the market because you know, if anyone's been following Metaverse, you, know, you think of the Metaverse as you know, cartoon characters meeting in virtual spaces, you know, a giraffe talking to Super Mario. <laughs> uh, but you know, try try being try try being an investor talking to the client or an architect talking to um, you know the, the, the customer, uh, and you're trying to convince someone of something, and you're a giraffe and they're Super Mario. Um, yeah. or, or, you know, a parent, you know, is, um, is, is Homer Simpson, uh, talking to Princess Peach, uh, to the child, you know, where's the intimacy, where's the connection apart from you identifying that you're both in a, in a, in a virtual world. Yeah. And so what we're doing is very contra to the metaverse. And, and I, I maintain my controversial opinion that I think the, the perception and the, the direction of the metaverse is a piece of shit. Excuse my French. And you can bleep that out. Um, no, no, we keep that in because it's interesting. The the, the whole uh, construction of uh, of uh, of the narrative around that metaverse technology uh, really degrades kind of where the utility and where the usefulness of these uh, incredible utility technologies will take us as humanity. And so, what we've done is essentially you know, stripped away all the idea about gamification and filters and avatars, and we've just focused on how do we make the mind of the receiver, i.e. you, Hilton, on your side, comfortable, confident, confident, uh, and engaged that it's actually me as an individual beamed into your space. Yes. Uh, and, and, that, and that's where we win on the psychological front. Absolutely. I mean, you and I have been talking a bit about this so for, I think it's a year now. Yeah. Um, and when I first saw Beam, it was probably earlier than that, so 18 months ago, so it was very early days. Yeah. Um, and it was very exciting for me, but it was only then, it was only by a device, not by glasses. It was just mm -hmm. pure, my mobile phone. I was taking somebody and bringing them and they were standing or sitting on the sofa next to me, or they were yeah. standing in the room in the space, but it was still FaceTime-y. Um, experience, but very exciting. Over the 18 months, I've understood that you've gone leaps and bounds, and it's all really been enabled by, which I believe is that bridge between the digital space and the physical space is the use of glasses, augmented reality glasses, which are as a, as a sort of a utility, because I've, I've, I've tried VR, and apart from being seasick sometimes, that's you 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 transport it into into a into a, an environment that is obviously very real, but the, you are in that space. You have no sense that you are in your own space. You know what I mean? Absolutely, and that's what's so psychologically powerful about you know, um, and the uh, you know you mentioned that we have gone leaps and bounds and. You know, we, we've been building this technology for a while and it's a very complex technology. I think, you know, kind of circling back to your previous question earlier about what would you have done differently? Uh, one of the things I would have, you know, I, I ponder every now and then is maybe I shouldn't have picked such a difficult challenge. Uh, maybe I should have just created a food delivery startup, uh, <laughs> connected <laughs> food to someone that's hungry um, yeah, and, and monetize the, uh, the, the transaction. But um but the the really interesting uh, thing about um, about that I think that AR specifically is, is so exciting is because it is your environment. Uh, it's basically the definition of AR is is that you're able to augment your own reality, or you're able to play place data and experiences uh, into your own space, uh, mm -hmm. and that's what that's what's really interesting. Uh, from a psychological standpoint, you know, I, I love the psychology behind tech innovation more mm -hmm. so than you know the technical uh, advancements. You know, we've seen um, these major advancements in computing over the last you know sixty odd years, um, and you know technologists have always kind of tried to create the next best thing and the next best thing, and the next best thing. But we're now starting to realize um, that uh, we can't keep reinventing the wheel uh, because it doesn't make it better. 
Uh, we need to look back and see how we as humans have psychologically interacted with the world uh, and create experiences that are more seamless. You know, one mm -hmm. example is we're using a lot of voice activation. We're using Alexa, we're using Siri, we're using all sorts of different voice activation. Why? Because we've used voice for thousands of years to, to obtain information in our environments. You know, if we met on the street, I'd, I'd say, you know, Hilton, can you, can you tell me where, you know, the nearest uh, restaurant is that serves good food? Uh, and you'll say, yeah, no problem. I can tell you. And so we're used to that. Psychologically, we're used to that. And we've realized we're going full, full circle in this human centered design process where we've been able to create new technologies. But now we, we, the, the technology is good enough that we can mimic nature. We can mimic the way that we've done things for thousands of years. Mm -hmm. uh, so augmented reality is our way of mimicking uh, the way that we've experienced data uh, and experiences uh, in our environment in our environments for thousands of years. And so this uh, this phone interface is is a very inefficient way for us as humanity to obtain information. Just think about it. You you tap a hard screen uh, to 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 ask a machine uh, a question, uh, and then the machine gives you an answer, and then you read it with your eyes. And then you process it with your brain and you try and figure out how does this information on the screen relate to my physical environment? Because that's what, mm -hmm. what that's all data and experiences do. They, they, they give us something for our own environments. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it should be much more simple. It should just be, if I want to know what the weather's like, I can look up at the sky behind me and say, show me Tuesday's weather. And I'll see Tuesday's weather over the sky. Or I can ask a human hologram in my space uh, a question about my environment and so this whole idea of augmented reality is I, I believe it's fully inevitable because we will go full circle uh, on uh, on technology mimicking the way that we've done things for thousands of years why and the one answer is we're lazy we're lazy as humans uh, we want it to be as easy as possible we don't want friction we want um, uh, ease of use uh, for, for everything we do in life now, this is very interesting because one of the, the biggest challenges that I see from any form of augmented reality, even if it's just a mobile phone, because that's all, you know, it's a, it's a connection to the digital world, is that the, 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 your, your tone, your intention, your body language, your, the way you interact with people is very subliminal in direct communication. But it, and your body, you've learned how to pick up on that. Your body subconsciously processes that and identifies that you're either stressed, happy, um, sad, da, 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 all these different emotions, purely by the tells of, of, of body language, the way you, you, you blink or whatever. Um, and those are learned experiences through the nurturing process. Now, what you're saying is that when we go into this, purely VR world or metaverse or even with the mobile phone, it's incredibly inefficient. It has cut out a lot of that subconscious and subliminal um, communication. And you've now talking about coming full circle where you are now enabling that level of communication again. Is that correct? Absolutely. And, uh, and I, th that's why I think this, this type of technology will become the next computing platform. Well, we'll see, you know, companies like Apple, you know, shy away from the terms VR, AR, metaverse, and say something like spatial computing, which is basically computing in your own space. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and that's where the bulk of our daily lives are spent. Um, you know, there will be a space for, for technologies like virtual reality. In the same way that you know, there's a space for us as humans to switch off from our reality, uh, you know, I, you know, for many years, and you know, me growing up in front of my little black and white TV, seeing The Simpsons in grayscale, you know, that was me switching off from reality um, and, and immersing myself into a world that doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not where you know daily life occurs. That's not where you know ninety you know plus ninety five percent of our human experience lies. Mm -hmm. uh, and so for that ninety five plus percent, you know, um, spatial computing or augmented reality is uh, kind of the, the natural next evolutionary step. Absolutely. I mean, it's effectively the death of the mobile phone. Death yeah. of a screen, uh, the, death, the death of a mobile phone, the death of a computer monitor, 
Um, you can literally create anything inside your world, uh, and it's, it's such a vast, uh, it's such a vast ecosystem. People always, you know, uh, ask me about augmented reality, and they say, "Oh, you, you're in AR. Can you do?" Can you uh, do this or can you do that? Or can you put a, you know, a dinosaur into you know, Manhattan and make it crush the buildings? Uh, it, but it, it's such a, it's such a vast ecosystem. It's literally replacing everything. Um, uh, I can't do that because I specialize uh, with, with Beam as a company. We specialize in uh, one specific, very important facet and that's communication, but everything else uh, is occurring around that as well. From things like creating cinematic screens in your household to you know, making your laptop obsolete because you know, your the, the the wood of your desk becomes a keyboard and and you know, screens can pop up wherever you want them to, okay. um, or you know someone can guide you down the street as a, as a tour guide. Um, and so, so you're essentially replacing the mobile phone with some form of say a wearable device which is attached to you, which is like a a, a watch and connected to a um, um to some processor uh, yeah processing glasses or just purely because the bulk of the technology sitting on your head would be very uncomfortable yeah absolutely and replaces I think there's, everything there's definitely a phase um of adoption and um you know this momentous moment this year where you know most of the big tech companies are announcing their augmented reality uh, hardware and ambitions mm -hmm. will be a little bit like a new iPhone moment. And everyone thinks back on the iPhone moment, think that was the day the iPhone launch was a groundbreaking day and the world changed immediately. That's mm -hmm. not the case. I mean, I think the the stats on the iPhone one was about a million or a million and a half in sales of the iPhone one in its first year, which, you know, looking back, you think that was a pretty weak product launch. Uh, if they only sold a million devices, Mm -hmm. uh, but it was the instigator for this new evolution. And I think we'll see that same sort of progress um, with AR glasses. We may see you know, Apple's glasses uh, launch you know, a million or a million and a half units in the first year. And then you know, generation two, three, four are really going to be kind of that mm -hmm. acceleration phase. The, the phone will still be the device of the consumer uh, for you know, at least the next four years. And, and like you said, the glasses will be an accessory where some experiences will be much better, uh, but not all experiences yeah. in the first instance. I mean, the, cha the challenge is that when AR gla or glass glasses first started, they didn't, there was a, there was a geeky uptick in terms of, 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 of using it, yeah. but it had very little utility. Now you're talking about the, you know, using augmented reality because you uh, the only way you can do it is through the glasses and you said there are millions of institutions now corporations who are building glasses because i think they've identified that this is the next way the next way forward definitely i think i think the ecosystem you know has learned a lot in the past 10 plus years since people started talking about augmented reality mm -hmm. um, and uh, there's been a lot of major challenges on the hardware side, also on the software side, um, that have been required to create something that is a thing of utility and also a thing of beauty. Because mm -hmm. you have to you have to convince the consumer to want uh, to use a device. You know, the mm -hmm. first the first smartphones. I think there was a a recent anniversary on. on on Motorola inventing the mobile device, which was a briefcase-sized uh, tool, you know, it took ages uh, for the technological uh, and the design advancements to to create, you know, the mass deployment of mobile phones. Mm -hmm. And we we've had those same challenges in this industry for the past ten years. Um, and there's also been kind of a you know a bit of a waiting game for the entire technological ecosystem to catch up. You know, things like internet speeds and the deployment of things like five G. Um, will greatly support the rollout of this type of technology, mm -hmm. uh, and, and you know all these like these tiny little innovations that you know for us we take majorly for granted as a society today. Um, you know that you know, 10, 15 years ago didn't even exist. Mm -hmm. You know we we have to remind ourselves that the World Wide Web, the public internet, 
didn't exist 30 years ago. Uh, the, the literal paper at CERN was released in May 30 years ago um, uh, to, uh, uh, to deploy the World Wide Web to the public domain. And so we've come an incredible, uh, incredibly long way in the past mm -hmm. 30 years technologically. You know, I, I was alive 30 years ago. I'm not that old. I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to be have been alive 30 years ago. And I can't even fathom what you know what what my parents uh, would have done to to function um, uh, in the same way that we do today. Uh, it's just it's just incredible. And so we've had this major tech advancements, and now we're reaching this convergence of the, you know the, the three things. One is um, the, the, the ecosystem as a whole technologically is able to support AR. Mm -hmm. uh, to uh, the technological innovations on the hardware side are coming to a form factor uh, and a size. You know, there's you know, Qualcomm have released um, a microchip that's able to fit into a, to a pair of glasses that look like this um, for the first time ever. Uh, and this is this is a very recent innovation on their on their on their part, and that creates a, a device that a consumer would be comfortable carrying, not mm -hmm. just from a weight perspective, but also from, from a looks perspective. Yes. Uh, our face is, is the most important real estate. Uh, and you know, if we, if we were asked to strap an iPhone onto our head, we would say no, because the design factor doesn't look good enough. Uh, and so we need something like this. Um, and then the third thing is all of the software and utility to support an ecosystem like AR is, is reaching a point of uh, maturity, not just, mm -hmm. you know, from what we're doing at Beam, but the hundreds of other uh, companies and innovative uh, concepts that will translate into this ecosystem. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm going to challenge you here. I know what you're doing is fantastic, and you're talking about creating an augmented reality environment, which is functions with some device, which is glasses or some wearable. From an ethical perspective, it's a it's a challenge. Have you in your skunk works or your discussion, your team in R&D, thought of um, implants and rather than wearables? So that, that's, a, that's been a discussion for, for quite some time in this industry, and it's really interesting. Um, but there's, there's, there's a scary premise, and you know, I, I, I don't sugarcoat sugar the ecosystem or the world because you know, I, I really like the psychology behind you know, what 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 happens technologically what we do uh in our business and what you know the entire entirety of humanity is like shooting towards and there's, there's a couple of premises i have and the first one is that evolution is inevitable you know we we looked at you know the whole uh concept of you know darwinism uh and then technology came along uh you know in the digital sphere i think not just human evolution but technological evolution is inevitable uh, you know, just look at what's happening uh, in the AI realms right now. It's inevitable that AI will be used for warfare. It's inevitable that AI will go too far in a number of uh, scenarios and ecosystems. Yeah. Um, because we as humanity, we can't stop uh, our, our lust for progress. Uh, and that, that throws up a bunch of really, really interesting challenges. Scary, uh, but also opportunistic challenges. Uh, and the the interesting kind of reflection uh that i have is you know what was the last big wave uh where we where we had this technological evolution which fundamentally changed the way that we as humanity operate uh and one parallel i can i can draw is is the social media age we had this huge onset of finally being able to connect everyone um in the digital sphere uh and you know social media is this huge beast uh that we can't prevent anymore because it was inevitable that it would happen. Uh, and now we have to figure out how to deal with it. And there was a number of years where social media uh, went too far in the eyes of us as humanity, psychological issues, self-esteem issues in, in adolescence, um, data protection, privacy issues. Um, and so we, we had this, we had this flexing of this new beast of social media. And then we as humanity started to try and reel it in. Uh, and, and make it work for us in a way that we as humanity are comfortable with. And we, we've had this over many, many iterations and generations. You know, when when steam powered factories came in, we thought it would be the death of um, you know employees being able to earn a living wage. 
uh, or, or even you know be able to grow their own food because now they have to work in factories and it's going to destroy the fabric of society. Uh, we managed that you know 150 years ago, um, and and you know we're, we're managing to to you know, start to get our brains on the social media beast. Um, but you know what, what's going to happen is 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 we're going to have these explosions of these new technologies like AI, like augmented reality, uh, like hardware. When you're talking about the transition between what happens after AR glasses, you know, do we have an implant um, that uh, can tell our eyes what we want it to see? Um, you know, these technologies will ultimately you know come in at, at some point in our technological evolution. This unstoppable lust for progress, and the question is, you know, can we reel it in? In the same way that we've reeled in every other technology before that, you know, will we reach a breaking point where we have so much new innovation that we can't reel it in, uh, or will we do what we've always done in the past? I, I don't know the answer to that. No, the thing is, it's it, the, the the challenge I I feel at the end of the day is we put the individual. At the moment, we're all slaves to technology, but what we want to do now is put ourselves in the center of the center of our of our lives, enabled by technology rather than controlled by technology, which means it's issues to do with data ownership, your sovereignty, how you're rewarded for that, and you know, how you interact with others, and that 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 terms of engagement and and et cetera, et cetera. This is all issues I think that regulators and society needs to grapple with. And until we break the cycle of the web two behemoths that have effectively contributed to a lot of the issues that we see today um yeah. you know we looked we looked to people like you and you, your co your cohort of of tech developers to try and be that voice and build the technology to ensure that it doesn't become part of that evolutionary change which is unsustainable uh, absolutely that's, that's it's such a great premise and the the, the whole web three movement um is in my opinion also it's it was an inevitability uh when you have such a centralization of technology with you know a few uh you know incredibly powerful organizations uh you get what web three has created and and my, my favorite analogy about web three is web three is just the modern age of piracy it's 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 a group of uh it's a, it's a group of individuals who are outside of um, the mechanisms that be, uh, who are trying to take back ownership, uh, from a monopolistic approach. And, um, you know, we've had piracy across the ages as well, but this whole web three movement is very interesting because, um, with web three and with all the technologies available, we're able to do a lot of good, uh, because there's a lot of incredible technologies that can scale the piracy, uh, to infinite levels almost uh, within our society. And I think, you know, as the problems in technology get, get larger, the ability to break the problems uh, from, you know, a grassroots level, you know, like, like the Web3 movement is, it is, is also much easier because you can, you know, create these huge communities um, and, and really, you know, sway the powers that be into, again, like clawing back, you know, the, the utility behind the tech, not letting it run away and to become a beast, but to, to harness it for you know what we as humanity want and need. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, I think I think you know, Web three will continue to to grow and and become you know a very driving for, force mm -hmm. because there, there always has to be uh, the yin to the yang. Right? So t tell us a little bit more about Beam in terms of where is it now today in terms of its technology and its rollout and and its and its how's it being used and once you've done that you can tell the audience how do they actually engage and 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 become Beamers. <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's it's a it's a great word Beam. Uh, it can be used as an adjective, <laughs> verb, a noun. Um, uh, so basically. Uh, Beam, just to, to kind of recap in its essence, is the infrastructure for anyone to uh, stream themselves into someone else's location to uh, be digitally present as if they're physically walking around in that space. Mm -hmm. So it's like you know, Star Wars Jedi Council hologram, but much higher definition, uh, or it's Star Trek, Beam Me Up, Scotty. Um, the, uh, 
the technology, you know, we like to say we've made a huge amount of progress, but with any challenging tech, uh, I believe we're just at the beginning uh, of our journey. Uh, we've created infrastructure. You know, we've had you know thousands of um, of users or user is, is a very toxic way. We've had thousands of people leveraging our tech um, to communicate with each other. Many multinationals have used it, and now we've gone a level deeper, and we've partnered with some of the big, um, big tech companies rolling out uh, this new era of computing. So companies like Qualcomm creating an operating system, T-Mobile um, uh, creating the connectivity, uh, companies like Google as well, uh, for us to become that fundamental utility layer, that process where anyone can use Beam for communication in the mm -hmm. same way that they use FaceTime currently. And so we're really so at these companies are building their product on top of your technology. Yeah, so we become we become the plugin. We become okay. the uh, we we become quasi you know the core feature on the iPhone. Um, but we become the core feature for any AR glasses, which will come to market over the next you know, twelve to eighteen months. Uh, kind of kind of a, in like a bit of a sneaky way, kind of like how WhatsApp came in and disrupted the text messaging system. We're kind of an external company that anyone can leverage uh, mm -hmm. to create program calling. Um, yeah, so so you know we're at we're at this really kind of groundbreaking phase where we have the tech ready. Uh, we have uh, you know a nice amount of initial traction, uh, and now you know the ecosystem is just exploding onto onto you know the world and onto society mm -hmm. this year. Where we can leverage. So, I mean, what we will be doing is we you just you very kindly said that you would provide us with a demonstration of how this works, which we'll be adding to the, the, the this podcast and a link to that. Absolutely, um, I'll follow up with the message. And people can download a version of this on their on their on their iPhone and their, their Android. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So we have um, we have a commercial license that we've been licensing out to large corps, uh, which provides kind of the full suite of our, our technology, including live streaming, live calling, uh, and recorded messaging. And we also have a, um, a limited recorded messaging feature, which is available to the public domain, available in the app stores as Beam, B-E-E-M. Uh, and uh, we'd love to get anyone's feedback uh, on, on the technology. Oh, fantastic. And so basically the best way to get in touch with you is through social media as well. If anybody want any any big B2B wants to engage with you, how do they find you? Yeah. They, they can find me on LinkedIn, uh Janos Amstutz, uh, or uh website uh www.beam.me, uh, or you can find uh me on other social media as well, like uh like Instagram and, and some other ones out there. That's very exciting. Yeah, and this has been a very interesting hour. I've learned a lot today. I'm super excited. Um, I've been watching what you've been doing for the last 18 months and where you've got to today is groundbreaking. And, and it's not only what you've done, it's the way in which you've done it. And I applaud your approach because you keeping to the core, the core of human communication in an augmented wor world. Uh, which I only believe at the end of the day is going to make our lives a little better. So thank you very, very much indeed for your time. Thank you, Jan. I really appreciate your time, Helton. Thank you so much. Thank you for viewing and engaging with today's podcast. If you're interested in knowing more about citiesabc.com with openbusinesscouncil.org and fashionabc.org, go to our platforms as well as you can find me on social media and DM me, Hilton Super, on Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram. And do go to the other interviews we have done on YouTube. And don't forget to like and comment. Thank you very much for your time and engaging with this interview on Cities ABC.